Hey everyone, Melanie here, co-managing director for The Wild. I'm so excited to introduce today's episode with Kevin Schneider of the Non-Human Rights Project. I'll never forget sitting in property law class the first time I realized that under the eyes of the law, animals are basically the same as a car or a couch, relegated to the realm of property with no real legal rights. Obviously, as sentient beings with feelings and families and hearts, animals deserve so much more recognition than that. And that's exactly what the Non-Human Rights Project is aiming to do, procure legal rights for animals. You know, if Amazon, the company, is a legal person, why shouldn't the Amazon rainforest, you know, likewise merit that? The silence is broken by somebody crying Trying to be heard, never a word Always the attitude, sort out your own Always alone, wishing for something The world is denying Out in the wilderness, somebody's crying Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayanna Young. Today we are speaking with Kevin Schneider. Kevin is an attorney and the executive director of the Non-Human Rights Project. Founded in 1996 by attorney Stephen M. Wise, the Non-Human Rights Project works to secure legally recognized fundamental rights for non-human animals through litigation, advocacy, and education. Our mission is to change the legal status of at least some non-human animals from mere things, which lack the capacity to possess any legal right, to persons, who possesses such fundamental rights as bodily integrity and bodily liberty, and those other legal rights to which evolving standards of morality, scientific discovery, and human experience entitle them. Our current plaintiffs are members of species who have been scientifically proven to be autonomous currently great apes, elephants, dolphins, and whales. We are working with teams of fraternities on four continents to develop campaigns to achieve legal rights for non-human animals that are suited to the legal systems of these countries. Wow. <laughs> well, welcome to For the Wild, Kevin, and thank you for all the work that you are doing in unraveling the threads of human supremacy and working for the autonomous livelihoods of our more-than-human kin. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I was actually taken aback just now how you described it. Uh, I think that's a, a beautiful way of, uh, of putting it, uh, unraveling the threads. And uh, so thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Unraveling the threads of human supremacy is definitely um, probably our favorite pastime here at For the Wild. <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited <laughs> for this conversation. And, um, you know, just to jump right in, since 2013, the Non-Human Rights Project has filed lawsuits on behalf of animals in captivity, including four chimpanzees and three elephants. So can you begin by sharing about the process that is taking place in the fight to secure these legal rights? And perhaps a second part to that question is, what strategies are utilized in your long-term litigation campaign to grant personhood to our more-than-human kin? It's a great question, and thank you again. Um, so in a, in a nutshell, I'll try to keep it uh, avoid too much legal jargon as much as as much as I can, and and really uh, I think we can because the the essence I, I like to think of of what we are arguing about is really rather simple. Uh, of course, then you get into the many other factors, uh, human supremacy, and certainly just our history, our culture, religion, philosophy. Uh, you know, so there are many obstacles to it. But to go to the beginning and and why we we focus on this um, and why we see the need. Uh, for what you refer to as legal personhood. So just from the outset, I think it's important to point out um, for folks who maybe have never heard of this concept before or have not really spent a lot of time thinking about it. So a person in the law is not a biological concept. It really never has been. And that's why, for example, it's always made sense legally uh, for corporations to be legal persons but I should also say that corporations includes nonprofits, right? So nonprofits actually benefit from that as well. Of course, we know there are lots of issues uh, relating to kind of corporate personhood and some abuses of that. But 
the fundamental is, I think, actually rather sound that the legal imagination can essentially give legal weight to these entities that are out there in the world. And of course, for much of our history, uh, sadly, you know, that personhood being non-biological, right, it goes both ways because it's only relatively recently that every human being in the world is a legal person. So if we go back 100, 200, 300 years, certainly slaves were categorically treated as things and brutally so. But also women and children and indigenous peoples uh, were all at one time treated as less than persons in one way or another. And in often with quite brutal results, because indeed, when you are not a legal person, there's only one other category as we see it. And as you know, we understand Western law, you know, there's some quibbles about this. And I'm here actually right now in, in Finland with a, a bunch of other animal lawyers from all over the world and had a very you know, productive and good exchange of ideas. From our perspective, you can either be a person or you can be a thing. And being a thing is not a good place to be if you are a sensitive sentient being. And to go further, um, you know, as to, you know, why this is, is, is really quite important is because in courts, uh, you know, we try to bring to the attention of the courts, these injustices, right, that say our chimpanzee or elephant clients are confined and held as property, really, and used for all kinds of money making endeavors, like any other kind of piece of property would be. And being things, they're invisible to our legal system. So we can go into court and, and seek to advocate on their behalf, but in a very real way, the judge is going to be blind to them because they are things. It would be equivalent, although a lot of people don't kind of like to admit the kind of full reality of it. It's, it's much like trying to file a lawsuit on behalf of a pencil or a book or your phone. And I think obviously, you know, people can see that as somewhat absurd, but I think it's equally absurd that you can have a chimpanzee, an elephant, an orca, really any animal be considered a legal thing to be bought and sold. And, you know, within some limits, uh, welfare and other things to be killed at the will of their owner or in a conflict with a human. Right. And so the situation we have now is. Every human being in the world is a person. That doesn't mean that there aren't still widespread rights abuses of human beings. Of course, that's still a very big problem all over the world, but that fundamental first step has been taken. And once you have personhood, you can then begin going about the process of saying, well, what rights are appropriate for this person or this class of persons? I think the other important thing to recognize about personhood is that it doesn't convey, you know, the whole suite of human rights. Again, using corporations as an example, you know, they can sign contracts, they can sue, they can be sued, they can own property, sell property, do all these rather you know, socially useful things, but they nonetheless can't vote or marry or drive. That should be pretty obvious, but um, it still stands for this, this important principle that simply being a legal person doesn't automatically entail all of these other rights. And I think that's important because the rights that we're seeking in our lawsuits for chimpanzees and now elephants and soon other species as well, which we can talk about, are what we consider very fundamental rights, liberty, or as you put it there, autonomy. And we can talk a little bit more about autonomy and, and why it's so important to our cases. And so we're not, you know, we're not looking at, uh, you know, a broad array of rights. What we're saying is that we go to courts and we say, look, your honor, this chimpanzee is an autonomous being. He, he or she has an interest in her autonomy, and that's really her free will. You know, science has demonstrated beyond a doubt that we are not the only species who have an interest in our freedom. And I think for a long time, this was written off as anthropomorphizing or, you know, somehow other doing bad science. But, you know, thanks to folks like Jane Goodall, who's on the board of the Non-Human Rights Project and has been for uh, decades, you know, we're now in a position where we can say no, actually to deny uh, that much of what goes on inside the minds of, of these animals is, is very much similar to us, you know, to deny that is actually committing, you know, the, the great scientific sin at this point, because to do that, you have to do a lot of mental gymnastics. And I think a great example is, 
someone looks at elephants who will grieve, right? So in the wild, when a member of their pack, their family dies, their herd, they will routinely, and this has been observed, come back year after year after year to the bones of their dead relatives and go to them in these solemn you know, gatherings and pick up the bones and have even been observed what we would call crying. Uh, you know, maybe a scientist would quibble with the description of all that, but to be able to look at that and say that they are not grieving in a way that is fundamentally the same as the way we do, I think requires just, you know, an active degree of blindness, really, to the world. And so we amass all of this stuff, right? We are putting all of this in from the legal arguments, the scientific arguments, the not so much the moral arguments, but they're there. I mean, the courtrooms are, morality is obvious. Sometimes it's, it's very much absent, but you know, it is certainly a part of our arguments as well. And to go back to this, this idea of autonomy, it is a very valuable thing. And I think it's something that people can identify with very viscerally. And even anyone who's interacted with an animal and seen, or a child or anybody, when you seek to deprive somebody's free movement and free will, they will typically respond pretty harshly and pretty quickly. Say, if you want to grab your cat and she doesn't want that, she might scratch you. And that's, you know, a way of saying, you're depriving my autonomy. Stop. Uh, she wouldn't put it in those terms, but that's essentially what's happening. And so, of course, autonomy is this fairly graspable, pretty obvious thing. But the reason we argue about it is, is not because of those reasons, but rather because the legal system for hundreds of years has held up autonomy as such a bedrock fundamental legal interest that we as lawyers being, I hope, good lawyers, we then take what the courts say the law is and apply it to our case. And so we're not going in and saying, judge, please, we beg you, be nice to the animals. Of course, you know, it's kind of what is in my heart in a certain sense. But as a lawyer, what we're doing is far more powerful than that, really, because we are taking the arguments that they and the things that they claim to value and believe in and essentially using them against the system itself. Because if we claim that we do value autonomy as much as we do, and now that it is beyond doubt that there are other autonomous beings in the world who have their own cultures and their own interests in their own families, their own histories, to simply throw that out and say that it doesn't merit any serious legal consideration and indeed personhood, that that is to really, what you might say, throw the baby out with the bathwater because it would be to reject the fundamental underpinnings of our liberal Western democracies. And so much of that starts with autonomy. And autonomy is, is even more is, is relevant in another way because autonomy is at the heart of what's called habeas corpus. So without getting into too much of the jargon, habeas corpus is an ancient legal vehicle, we call it, which is you know, just a way to get into court and make an argument because you, you need that. You can't just you know, show up to court and say, hey, judge, I want to chat with you. You need to have either a statute or some kind of rule that gives you a, a way into court. And so habeas corpus, what that means is that it's Latin for produce the body. It's been around since probably the 13th century uh, or around then. And what it means uh, and what it's used for is to test the legality of any confinement and historically human confinement. So say you find yourself uh, maybe in a debtor's prison and you're in medieval you know, Europe and you believe that it's unjustified, it's wrong, you paid that debt. Well, you can have somebody or you can uh, have a petition filed or have it filed on your behalf, a habeas petition. And that goes to a judge and a judge will review it because that's a very serious thing. And indeed, it is the the bedrock, the oldest, you know, the kind of foundation of, of the Western liberal order, uh, liberal in the sense of the kind of classical, classical sense, not the kind of modern political sense. And so with this, this notion of you know, autonomy and being so protected and so important, again, we, we come with, with the science and say, you know, here's your honor as another autonomous being. But even more to the point, uh, with habeas corpus, it has a history of actually being used to transform legal things into legal persons. And so uh, in, the, in the 1780s, there was a famous case in England, the Somerset case, and that was the first time 
that a, a judge declared in response to a habeas petition that a human slave who walked into court as a thing was in fact a legal person. And so that actually, many people point to that as one of the key changes that led to the beginning of the end of human slavery in England and then in the United States. Because indeed, we take, in the US, we get our common law and so much of our law from England, of course. And and so this, this Somerset case I mentioned is part of the common law of much of the United States and certainly New York and Connecticut, where we have our first lawsuits. And so we, that gets kind of added to this mess, right? So we say, you know, your honor, there's a, there's, there's a roadmap of sorts that's been laid out. Of course, we're not comparing the conditions of slavery, human slavery to, uh, to, to what happens with our clients, but the fundamental point there is completely sound that, uh, again, you have a legal thing that in all rights ought to be a legal person with, again, at least the capacity for uh, at least one right, at least this. And, and again, we would say that that fundamental right being, you know, the right to th their liberty, their freedom, their autonomy. And so armed with all of this, we go into court. We've been in court uh, in New York since 2013. Uh, we've gone up and down the appeals process. Um, I can go into a little more detail about that. And since late last year, we've been uh, litigating in Connecticut as well on behalf of three elephants. So there were four chimpanzees in New York and so far three elephants in Connecticut. And we've had, you know, a lot of, uh, say, fits and starts, a lot of obstacles thrown in our way, particularly in New York, just because we've been there, you know, for almost five years now. And, you know, in the course of all of that, we've, we've seen judges really come very close to granting and endorsing um, our view and our argument. We've also had judges react the complete opposite way and while they don't come out and say, you guys are, you know, terrible and wrong for trying to do this, they do say that personhood and rights are restricted to the human species. And so uh, for folks familiar with the philosophy of this stuff, this is about as pure a uh, speciesist statement as one can find. Uh, indeed, in our uh, last uh, appeal in New York that uh, we can talk a little bit more at the at the mid level, you know, the second court to hear that particular case. They came right out and said it finally that, you know, this chimpanzee doesn't get rights because he's not a member of the human moral community. And, you know, this just raises all kinds of problems, so much so that in response to that and, and some of these other rulings, we went and so we always, you know, commission and ask experts. I shouldn't say commission, ask, ask experts to uh, submit briefs to the court. They're called amicus curiae briefs, which is, again, Latin for friend of the court. And so they're not a party to the case, but they can still uh, add their thoughts, any kind of research, evidence, any basically things that the parties might otherwise not be prepared to introduce, but are nonetheless important. So among those briefs that we had filed in our New York chimpanzee rights cases was a brief by 17 philosophers all throughout the U.S. and Canada. And for one, I mean, from the outset, you know, I think we were just extremely happy and thrilled that we got all of these very smart people to agree to one to one thing, you know, 17 philosophers with quite diverse views, you know, all interested in animal ethics. But nonetheless, you know, they still made a very resounding argument in favor of personhood for chimpanzees and, you know, went through all of these you know, very weighty philosophical reasons why um, it's irrational and wrong to restrict legal personhood and rights to human beings, or somehow make the capacity for uh, personhood be contingent on your species. It's the sort of thing that sounds like, I think to an uneducated ear, it might make some sense. So they can't take on duties, they can't vote, they can't be held accountable for their actions. Therefore, why would we give them rights? But if you really think through the ramifications, that's a really dangerous idea, not least because we have many humans among us who don't fit the category, you know, fit the description of being autonomous. Children, you know, anyone with a mental disability or certain mental disabilities or uh, someone with Alzheimer's disease. These are not people who are autonomous in the sense that they can really navigate the world and, and survive the world on their own. And nonetheless, we don't say they're not persons. Of course, um, they still are entitled to dignity and, you know, their rights as as persons. And so 
we have you know hit a few walls on the way, but that's to be completely expected. We are trying to change a status quo that has existed in the world for at least 2,000 years. The idea of, of splitting the world up into things and persons and having animals categorically be things goes back to, to, to Roman times. And we've been really living with that and the ramifications of it ever since. And so it's not surprising to us at all that the courts haven't just kind of rolled over and given us what we wanted. But we have seen um, really now we're actually in, in just the last six months, we are starting to see uh, some real cracks in the facade such that we are now having, for example, back in May, one of the uh, high, so the highest court in New York is called the Court of Appeals. And one of the judges on that court, who is one of the most powerful judges in the state of New York, which is itself an influential state and powerful state, important state, he came out and said that he came very close to granting us, you know, endorsing um, and, and agreeing with our arguments because of some procedural matters that are sort of a little less interesting. We didn't actually we haven't actually broken through yet, but it's becoming it's very clear that we're getting to the point where, you know, we've essentially we've painted the legal system into a corner. And, and that's by design. Right. It goes back to using their arguments in a certain way against them and advancing our arguments. And I think we're, we're starting to, I don't think, I know, we are finally starting to see the, you know, the outcomes of that. goodness that was such an incredible introduction and I was following so many of the threads and the stories and imagining you in court or you know the people you work with talking to these judges and it's fascinating it's also a bit depressing that this is the way our system is set up and I understand what you're saying about the legal power of being able to have these um discussions in court, you know, because in so many ways, this is, the courtroom has a lot of power in our, in our country, in the world. I mean, there, there's all these different strategies of how we want to change the system and this being a very powerful one. But one thing that you had brought up at the very beginning of your last response was the corporations as personhood. And not that this 
has much to do with the Non-Human Rights Project. I just want to briefly touch on that because I feel like I really understand what you're talking about with animals having rights, that they are not things. And this is, it really just shows the disconnection we have to the earth and living beings to think of them as things without rights, without autonomy, without sentience. It's it's actually kind of insane to think that they don't or that we're somehow supreme because we actually need the earth to survive. <laughs> they don't need us. So it's it's just really interesting to think on that. But and not to go into that wormhole because I could really I could really go there. But yeah, I, I just want to touch on the corporations thing. Like Yeah. Yeah. And again, like so so I guess to, to rewind a little bit, there's an important distinction because uh, when people hear about this, it's often in the context of, say, a recent Supreme Court case, Citizens United or Hobby Lobby. There have been some others that really have in a, have had negative uh, outcomes. Right. But what's going on there is is actually quite uh, is certainly problematic, but is not is, is a little bit different than what we're talking about, because when we talk about legal personhood, we're talking about the common law. And the common law is the law that judges make. And it's actually a pretty unique thing in the world. It's it's only really English or English speaking countries that maintain this tradition. And it's a it's a tradition where case law matters a lot. And what that means is that the written decisions of courts over decades and hundreds of years, you know, all that mass of stuff and reasoning and logic and trying to make sense of the mess of human experience as best, you know, that we can. It, it grows into this thing that we call the common law. And that's quite distinct from, you know, other con- particularly European countries that have a civil law. It's a very kind of detailed statutory codes. But the judges in those countries are really almost take on more of a ministerial function in a sense. They're really just literally applying the law. I shouldn't say ministerial, but they're really just applying the law as written. Whereas in the U.S. and other um, common law countries, you do still have some areas where you can get into this common law. So what we have in the U.S., though, is and since uh, for now it's been about 125 years, you have to go back to a, a, a case, the Santa Clara Railroad case, uh, or Santa Clara versus Union Pacific. I forget the exact name of it, but in the late in the 1890s, the Supreme Court had a case involving you know a railroad that you know, I don't even know the facts, but essentially the railroad wanted to have as a as a person, wanted to have the protection of the federal constitution. And without even really, without any discussion or analysis, what the, what the Supreme Court did there back in the 1890s was they almost by a slight, it really was a sleight of hand. They took this idea of, of, of a corporation being a common law person and then just transformed it into giving them rights under the U S constitution and specifically the 14th amendment due process clause. And I can imagine the kind of railroad lawyers, mercenary types, probably getting a huge kick out of the fact that they took a constitutional provision designed to help freed slaves and had it subverted and turned into something to advance corporate interests. It's a huge, and it's had obviously a very, in a lot of ways, destructive legacy. And I think it's actually something that really does urgently need to be addressed. But if we go back, this fundamental idea of a corporation or any business or any association, it can even be nonprofits or clubs or guilds or almost anything you can imagine where it's an association of people, they have been classed as, quote, persons for hundreds of years. And it's something that goes back, again, to English common law. And the reason why I, I would I would argue that it's it's at least, you know, theoretically at its at its base, a, a quite useful thing. If you think about, you know, say you want to start a business or you want to, um, you know, kind of do anything, you you would set it up. But, you know, what happens if if you get sick, or if you die, if if things go wrong, if there's no if the whole enterprise is tied to you and it could very easily just cease to exist, it could disappear, it could fall apart. But by giving this legal shell to these to these you know entities quote unquote that we've corporations as a as an abstract you know kind of thing by doing that we make it possible to and again this is a really like a feat of the legal imagination somewhat in in a lot of ways somewhat similar to what we are trying to do because 
it it takes this this idea of a, a you know a human being right and, and applies it to really something rather different. And by doing so, again, you can have uh, this entity, this corporate person, quote unquote. And you know, and I should also say that it's pretty rare that they're even referred to in those terms. That's only relevant for us because again, only persons can have rights. And for the vast majority of cases, you know, the the concept of personhood just doesn't come up. Um, because while it does seem, or I, I think oftentimes when folks are thinking about or, or, or learning about the law, there's this tendency to, to assume or believe that there's, <laughs> that someone kind of sat down and really thought about it at one point. But particularly when you look at the common law, it accretes over time. And there's a lot of like messy wrinkles in this, you know, kind of tapestry that we've been building for the last, you know, hundreds of years. And so it's uh, this is not you know where we look to for for purity or for um, you know any of that. It's it's really just the um, again. I and I think in it it kind of has a beauty to it in the sense that the common law recognizes that you know history and precedent and past human experience does matter and it does inform current situations and we should learn from our mistakes. But it's also I think a recognition that we don't have it all figured out. And that's really the beauty of the common law is that it is able to do things like expand and say, hey, this human being that you're treating as property. Well, you know, the common law just says that can't happen. And the common law then becomes this, you know, tool for uh, for really advancing justice. And so, yeah, I hope that wasn't you know too much. But, you know, in, in thinking about it, you know, yeah. theoretical matter, you know, and, and, and again, you know, nonprofits are corporations. And so that means that we enjoy First Amendment protection. We there's all these like structural things that it actually does make sense, but with the caveat that you know having constitutional rights, it, it, it does in Citizens United things like that. It it has gone really off the rails for sure, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, and I think I think that perhaps there were good intentions when putting. Perhaps, you know, I, I kind of almost doubt that, that there were good intentions in putting these systems, legal systems into place, because really, if we did a tally mark of who the legal system is protecting, it's not the majority of humans or species more than human species. And so I, I don't personally think that corporations, whether it's a nonprofit or extreme oil resource extraction company, whether it's e either of those two extremes of corporations, I don't think that personally that they should be considered persons. They're not persons, but I, I see how you're talking about it in terms of the legal framework. I think it's also interesting how in the legal system, things are somehow viewed as objective when I don't actually believe in objectivity because objectivity again is thinging. It's thinging objects. What is an object? I mean, this is all created off somebody's or a group of people's mindset. This isn't law, law to who? It's not the law of the land. It's not the law of the way the actual natural world functions. So, um, I th you know, it really gets me fired up in this way of just being frustrated, but also being extremely intellectually interested in understanding these systems because you know, if I was kind of standing back as some type of anthropologist looking into our legal system, I could be interested when I look at it as a human living being who really cares about what's happening to the earth. It's so frustrating. And I've seen case after case after case that's just been, um, gosh, just really, really ridiculous outcomes that somehow our legal system protects these outcomes. Because like I said, you know, when you really tally up who are is the legal system protecting, it's usually not the indigenous people. It's usually not the people of color. It's usually not the people who have been most oppressed. It's not the animals. It's not the land. It's not the rivers. It's not the mountains. It's not climate change. It's not, it's none of those things. So, um, that's, that's just where I'm coming from, but I have so many thoughts and questions to ask you that I want to, like I said, to pull myself out of that wormhole. I would just say though, um, just briefly, if I could, that when you talk about intentions, I think I don't even look to that because, again, to me, this is it's a blooming, buzzing confusion. I think um, so often we uh, we think we know more than we do. And that's, of course, a real problem. But I also think that, yeah, like you said, the the law 
is very often used as a, as a tool to oppress. And personhood, again, is a perfect or has been an example of that. So while uh, it's very ironic now for us to see in some of our cases, you know, judges hold up this notion of personhood as if it's like a kumbaya, we're all in the human moral community, when a cursory review of the history of personhood shows that for the vast majority of the time it was you're either in the club, which was largely you're a white man and a landed landowning white man, or you're not in the club, which is everyone else. And in that way, I think the law at its kind of worst can can simply be a reflection of existing power imbalances and unfairness. But I think in the face of that, and you know, certainly being a little bit cynical and weary of it for sure, but um, also recognizing that there are tools that we can kind of hack into and and use to advance the cause of justice as messy and kind of imperfect as uh, as that might always be. But I would also say we're starting to see the concept of legal personhood be applied to parts of the environment all over the world, rivers, mountains. The Colombian Supreme Court a few months ago declared that the Amazon rainforest is a legal person, a legal entity under Colombian law. What this means for the future remains to be seen, but it is absolutely being done for the purpose of protecting and preserving that ecosystem. And so I think that, and I, I think of it in a, you know, if Amazon, the company is a legal person, why shouldn't the Amazon rainforest, you know, likewise merit that? If we even think about from a selfish point of view, how much we get from an ecosystem like that. And I think that's also part of, of what's happening too, as we understand more how, you know, just how vital these, these, these things are to us. What we used to call a swamp is now a valuable wetland, right? Because we learned that it does, it provides a whole lot of benefits to us and helps us, uh, you know, stay alive and, and prevents flooding and gives us water. And so while I, I always, you know, try to, um, particularly in our cases, right? Like always through the lens of the interest of the animal, the non-human animal, we can't, I think, ignore the fact that there's also an argument to be made that this advances our human interests as well. It's going to certainly crimp the wallets of some people who now make a lot of money off of doing bad things to animals. But in the long term, for all of humanity, I do believe that it's it's a, a very important and, and, and positive thing. So we can talk more about. And the, that's the other thing I should say is that we are not here to say personhood is great. Like we inherited right. this system. Right. Yes. It's there. So we have to work with it as no, lawyers. Absolutely. We can't, you know, say, you know, and I, I do get that. But I also um, so we kind of try to do both things. And we're the most conservative radicals or the most radical conservatives in the world, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I no, I think that using this legal framework as a tool is absolutely necessary at this time. I have been following up with what's been happening in New Zealand um, with the rights of the river. I think it was Tio Rawera and then the Waganui River, um, right? And then, you know, Sariaku people in Ecuador are proposing a new international category for the permanent protection of native land through giving living entities personhood. So I, I'm very pro using the legal system as a tool in this framework. And I also just, you know, it, it's frustrating to, to look in and see that our legal system doesn't actually protect life itself because if it did we'd live in a very different world i mean i think about mining and just the disasters that have come from mining and the challenges of getting these persons these corporations to actually clean up the mines that are killing the last intact salmon runs i think it's actually insane um what we're doing and the fact that the court doesn't uphold morality I think there is a major issue there, and I, I know we could argue morality and what is moral and what isn't and what framework and what religion are we following morality from, but I think that there is a morality in terms of protecting life, whether or not you follow some type of religious framework. And to take morality out of the system, although it could be challenging to have some type of moral constitution, it just, I think it, it just keeps us in this human exceptionalist mindset and this mindset that we as humans can do whatever we want to anything, people more than humans, natural landscapes that we can take, we can change, we can pollute, we can kill, we can 
take captive whatever we want. And we can actually even have a legal framework and a economic framework to do just that and to actually make money off killing, uh, make money off murdering this earth, which is in so many ways what we're doing. I mean, I've spent the last three months up in uh, British Columbia, the Yukon and Alaska, and seeing the devastation here in the last intact ecosystems in the world. I mean, there's, there's so few places left that actually have natural systems working. And to see just the edge of what this global economy is pushing, like this edge of, of, life itself is is so I'm really I'm really fired up right now and and hearing your responses and I do want to ask you you know you've touched on sentience a lot and I know animal rights arguments are based upon sentience and the non-human rights project has chosen to focus on species for whom there is scientific evidence of self-awareness so I'm wondering if you view these qualities as necessary for recognition of personhood and if you could elaborate on why you've chosen this tactic and how it's forging a meaningful path forward. That's a great question. Yeah. And so we actually don't premise our cases on sentience exactly. They are on autonomy. Now, it gets a little bit squishy there. I mean, there's a lot of kind of gray area. And then we're also dealing with the fact that we're you know, one's norm. There, you're. You got a normative system on one hand, and a descriptive, or hopefully descriptive, on the other. Um, they don't always play together so well, and I think we see that with climate change litigation now. It's just kind of denial of of science that happens in so many ways. So we again look at autonomy because there's just a rich tradition of courts upholding it and really giving force to it and going to great lengths to protect it. And that is bundled up, right, with, with, with sentience in a lot of ways, for sure. And, and you might even think about it in terms of kind of the level of compl- complexity of it. And to go to your second question, because we are always extremely careful to, to make this as clear as possible, we are not in any way arguing that uh, what is necessary for, for personhood. We argue, well, I don't even think that there sh- is or should be such a checklist or anything like that. Because if we're talking about the ability to, to have a, a, say, legal personality and have rights, and, and indeed to be protected, right, that should never be closed. Like, we should never erect walls to, to, to the expansion of that, if nothing more than to allow future generations who are hopefully um, better equipped and in a better place to continue that expansion. So we never, ever say that anything is a necessary quality for, for personhood. But what we do is... Uh, Again, we go back to the autonomy, and that's really what all of our scientific evidence, you know, with all of our cases, we file hundreds of pages of expert affidavits that lay out in great detail. And I should also mention that everything we've ever filed or ever will file goes up uh, right on our website so anyone can read it and use it and share it. So we introduce all this scientific evidence that really is meant to establish that these are, quote, autonomous beings. But, you know, there's no standard definition of that in the world. And we know that. But what we do is it was we just try to, in a lot, in a real, very real way, overwhelm the court with how much is, is now known about them that, that, that we never knew before. It's a natural question, I think, of, well, if you're starting with these species, great apes and whales and dolphins, I mean, that's great, but there's not that many. They aren't the ones who are really suffering in the greatest numbers under humans. Uh, say chickens or pigs or cows or so many others. But I think we have to recognize uh, a few things that we're trying to do something very monumental here. It's never been done, certainly not in the U.S. We're starting to see glimmers of non-human animal personhood in, in other countries, which has been great, but it's not yet happened in the U.S. And so we think that we need to maximize, make the best case that we can we, we focus on these just just very obvious autonomous beings. And certainly what we believe and, and, and write and, and say is that, and again, going back to the common law, it expands as our understanding of science expands. Um, and so I think over time, we will see more and more species as autonomous. But I also think that we can't ignore the reality that um, I think it's 
likely or possible that you could you know, establish autonomy and say a pig in some meaningful way. But the idea that one could just go and make the arguments that we're making on behalf of a pig in the United States right now is, is just, I think, a non-starter because you would be asking a judge to, you know, do something quite different than, than what we're doing with our, with, our, with our cases. So, for example, in Connecticut, there's three elephants, uh, a traveling circus. And this, I think, is, is, is a you know, good example because they're obviously not native to Connecticut. You know, they're all stolen from various parts of Asia. They're all Asian elephants, Beulah, Minnie, and Karen, for you know, 30 or 40 years, forced to give rides and everything else. And so they're not native. There's, clearly, there's not that many of them in the U.S., and they also don't have, and, and this is, you know, sounds awful to say, but they don't have a high economic value in the sense that there aren't, you know, multi-billion dollar industries that are built around raising and killing and selling their flesh the way that there are for, again, cows and pigs and chickens. And so we're not creating any kind of necessary conditions or, or advocating necessary conditions for personhood. But at the same time, we are... Um, we're being somewhat narrow. And I think that it's, it's a strategic and important thing. And, and also because when we go into court, again, as lawyers, we put on different hats. And if, if we're seen to be, frankly, too ideological in the sense that we're trying to uh, I almost lever too much change um, or, for, or kind of force the judge to make more change than he is comfortable making, then, um, you know, that could, would just be an almost uh, an obstacle that we would have a lot of trouble ever getting around. And when we look at the situation now, you know, because we have to, you're dealing with a human being, right? The judge, we have this idea that we get, I think we grow up in the system and it is kind of, uh, frankly, um, a little absurd sometimes to how powerful our judges can be or, you look at the Supreme Court and a lifetime appointment, and I think we need to. I think we really need to rethink that and go back to uh, to how we how we do those appointments. Uh, but you know, the the, the issue I think that, and I, I've raised this to, to bring out something that we've seen from a number of judges. They're uncomfortable. They they don't want to. They don't want to go too far ahead, and I think they some of them have a fear, and it's not a baseless fear, right? that if a chimpanzee, an elephant, becomes a legal person for the first time ever, and we can suddenly have animals who can have legal rights, what might that do to society, right? Um, I think the people who are afraid or opposed to us would say, you know, give you a doomsday scenario in their mind, right? That everyone's going to be compuls compulsory veganism and, uh, you know, X, Y, Z. And I just, you know, obviously, I think that's pretty uh, reactionary and quite absurd. But I do think it's fair to say that we don't know what it looks like. We've never had that world. That shouldn't stop us from taking the first bold steps into that world. And indeed, you know, happily, we've had judges who have, you know, had the, the courage and I would say the, um, you know, the clarity of thought to say, you know, no, this, this case is about this chimpanzee or this elephant. And it may indeed have impacts for other animals, but that's the way it should be, right? If it's a good decision and if it, it can carry further, then that's the way the law, the common law in particular, is supposed to work. And so we've seen both sides of that argument. It's, it's kind of it's called the slippery slope. The idea that if you let this happen, a chimpanzee, an elephant, tomorrow it's going to be a cow, a pig, a chicken. And so, um, you know, we, we, we have to also keep in mind at all times that we're we're working on a lot of different fronts at once. You know, we have this very kind of artificial uh, forum of the courts. Right where we have to make very specific types of arguments and think and argue in certain ways. But then we also have to think about, well, how do we present this? Like what I'm doing right now, how do we present this, the bigger picture to the world, you know, so that folks can understand it. And even more, you know, how do we, in a process that we're, you know, very much involved with now, how do we get these various segments of society, um, everything from, you know, business to government, to, to religious groups, uh, faith leaders, how do we get folks to begin to, you know, digest all this and incorporate it? And, you know, for me, that's where the real beauty of, of being able to file and argue lawsuits like this is because it's, it's sort of like a cauldron, right? The legal system is a very intense uh, 
in its real kind of good form. It's this rigorous uh, analytical process. And what comes out on the other side is this sort of hardened, kind of baked, you know, sturdy, uh, one would hope, item of law. And so we're now at a place which is really exciting for us with this decision that we got in May from the from the High Court in New York, where we no longer have to be the ones, you know, kind of making the arguments. Indeed, if you go on our website and read this opinion, which I encourage everyone to do, it's only about six, seven pages. It's really, a, it's a beautiful thing. You have this powerful judge saying things like, our cases speak to our relationship with all the world around us, and that the categorical denial of rights to all animals is a manifest injustice, and that a chimpanzee is certainly not a thing. Uh, you know, this opinion is full of this beautiful language. It's, it's almost too it's almost too good that we wouldn't even write it because we would be afraid that the judges would think, oh, you know, this is too much. And so I think that is 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 so important because while it can seem, I think, unsatisfying, oh, you're doing one case at a time and they take years, like what, how, how are you ever going to really make a dent in anything? I think the reality is it's quite different because when you have something like this, and, and maybe the U.S. legal system is somewhat unique in this way, you know, cases like this can really serve as drivers for legislative action, for all sorts of positive changes. And, and indeed, we, we're already seeing that. We've had interest from you know, legislators on, on all levels who have approached us or have responded to us and to say that, yeah, we support what you're doing. And, and so, you know, we're now getting to that point where we're just starting to see the fruits of our labor kind of come out in a really uh, substantial way. Wow, Kevin, this has been such an incredible conversation, and I feel like I could speak with you for many, many hours, <laughs> but I also know that it's late where you are. Well, I'll come back. Okay, well, this, this is good, because I, de I definitely have a lot more questions and, and thoughts to mull over with you, so um, this has been just, it's been a great conversation, has really gotten my wheels turning, has definitely added kindling to my fire. I feel pretty yeah, I feel very fired up. So it's it's good because for me, it's in the morning. So it's like I don't even need a cup of coffee. I just need to talk about uh, legal issues. And there I go. So <laughs> thank you so much. And um, well, that's see, that's happy to do that. Anytime we can, um, anytime we can do that, we're happy. And so, you know, nonhumanrights.org. We're on uh, Facebook, but we our Instagram is way more fun, <laughs> my personal opinion, just because Facebook is mm, Facebook. And so we're on Twitter. We're everywhere. We also have a documentary film about us. I should mention, uh, interesting, um, it came out on HBO two years ago. It's called Unlocking the Cage. It's been on the BBC and French national television. And it was done by two of the most uh, kind of decorated and prominent documentary filmmakers, certainly in the U.S. And it was just nominated for a news and documentary Emmy for best social justice documentary. So wow. we'll actually be at the uh, news and documentary Emmy Awards in New York in, in a couple of weeks. And and, you know, that's just one more signal to us that the world is starting to you know see this as a what we have always seen it as a serious social justice issue and really following in the heels of of previous ones. And so for anyone who wants to learn about our work and any of our filings and everything that we do. Uh, we have a really I'm proud of our website and how much we uh, put on there. And, and, and of course, you know, if anyone, uh, we always, you know, are looking for financial support and perhaps more interestingly, you know, folks to, to volunteer and just remain in our network so that as we go forward, um, you know, we, we may very well be trying to pass a, a rights bill in, in your city or your state. So uh, having folks in our network that we can, you know, reach out to and give hopefully give, you know, tangible opportunities to uh, really assist us and 
in making making all of this happen. Well, thank you for letting us know that, and I definitely um, support what you're doing, and I'm sure all the people who are listening in will too. So, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for listening to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayanna Young. The music you heard today was by Isaac, Opatz, and Sana Ra. Our theme music is Silence Returns by Bo and Like a River from Kate Wolf. I'd like to thank our incredible podcast team, our producer and editor, Andrew Stores, our research collaborator, Francesca Glassbell, our media director, Molly Lebov and our music coordinator, Carter Lou McElroy. If you haven't read us on iTunes, please do so as it helps spread these messages further and further. And sign up for our newsletter on our website at forthewild.world. I'm country trails and wild.